minute in case people come from the other talk. So uh, there's, a, there's a saying that says that every situation in life is accurately and completely described by an XKCD comic. So that's mine for this talk. Uh, and so the talk is going to be about Python and the general ecosystem of Python surrounding Postgres. So uh, my name's Jan. Uh, that's my company. And that's my email. And so if you want to get the slides, you can get them from there. Uh, it's called snakes and elephant PDF. If you want to follow with the code, you can try doing that. But I recommend just doing that afterwards with the slides if you, if you want to. Uh, so where? Make virtual and virtual. Yeah, there's a type. Uh, so it's just, you know, if you want to get the slides, follow on or, or back up on stuff. So uh, the, the basic idea of this talk was to give some guidance to people that, uh, you know, are either consulting on or projects that use Python or their companies are starting to use Python and they kind of need to take, make decisions on that. Or for DBAs that work in Python shops and, you know, the Pascal developers are giving them trouble and they need to kind of understand what's, what's going on with it. So we're going to do a quick, like a quick glance of the language and uh, the pointy question of which version to choose. Uh, then we're going to talk about drivers, so how do you actually talk to the database, because uh, that's, a, that's a long history with Python. Then we're going to take a look at the ORMs, because you, if you do application development, you might end up having contact with an ORM, and you might have to deal with it. Uh, and then we'll see PL Python, which is uh, embedded Python inside Postgres. Uh, and, and we're going to try to have some fun with that. So uh, Python is uh, an old, boring enterprise technology. So unlike all those you know, hip languages that cool kids use, like Java, PHP, and all these, these kind of new projects like Postgres, uh, Python was released in 1991, the first version. So it is of legal drinking age in 2012, unlike the other projects. Uh, it's, it subscribes to a philosophy. It's a double mic, you could use. All right, fine. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to attach that. Hello, OK. So it, it subscribes to a philosophy that says there should be one way to do it, as opposed to Perl. So it, it, really, it really puts, uh, you know, it really tries to be maintainable, readable, you know, it's a do-gooder language, as, as people would call it. Uh, and then it's used by big shops like, you know, Google, NASA, it's, it's really widespread, so uh, it, it's, it's something you, you might consider and, uh, and it's, it's, it's quite popular. Uh, so what problems as Postgres people do we have with Python? So uh, there's so many drivers. You can just, you know, if you Google uh, Python driver for Postgres, you'll get lots of stuff. And you'll get really old stuff, really you know, obsolete stuff. You'll get misconceptions. So we're going to try to clean up that. There are quite a few RMs. Uh, there's, there's kind of confusion of which one to use. Uh, I'd like to give some visibility to the ones I consider that are good. Uh, then there's this Python 2, Python 3 mess that if people are not really into Python, they kind of asked, should I use the latest version? Should I, I mean, th that's a question that comes up repeatedly. So the idea of the talk is to be opinionated. And so I will make some assertions that if you, I mean, if you don't subscribe to, we can, we can talk them over. But the, the idea is to, you know, 
you go and do your research, but these are kind of my recommendations. So, uh, so yeah, the version, right? 2.7, we're done, let's, let's move on. Uh, actually, so Python 3 is the future of the project. It will come, it will become the standard. It's not the standard yet, so, you, so just stick with, with 2. Why? Because everything works with 2 and not everything works with 3. And uh, there's no real reason why to you know, go to the bleeding edge that's gaining adoption but still not there, while you can just stick with the, with the thing that's now widespreadly used. If you write your stuff in a correct way and use a recent version, you will not have that much pain porting. So think about it, but stay with Python 2, preferably 2.7. So if you, if you do the things right, you will have a path to Python 3 upgrade in the future. But for now, 2.7. And the, this, this whole talk is kind of, I will be saying, so this works with 2, this works with 3, but 2.7 is, is the thing you should be doing. OK, uh, let's see how can you talk to the database from Python. So there's something called dbapi20. Uh, this is a standard uh, blessed by the community of how do you talk to a database. Uh, it's, you, you might come across it as, uh, people refer to it as pep, pep 249. Uh, PEPs are like RFCs for, for Python. So uh, that, that describes kind of the baseline of what a driver should do. It's really bare bones. It's supposed to work with any database. So it's kind of the lowest common denominator of database access for Python. And so many drivers just take this and then they implement their own stuff because it, it doesn't contemplate the features you can get from like Postgres because this in theory, dbapi should be used identically with, with SQLite, MySQL, you know, DB2, Postgres. So main drivers provide extensions, and you will have to use extensions if you want to really, you know, use the database fully or, or even kind of usefully. And so a lot of people, especially I've come across a lot of people in the Postgres community that kind of hate on dbapi. But it is really useful. It has proven to be, so it, it's good to have a baseline. And you have tools that can assume, OK, so there's, this is at least DB API plus some stuff. But you have things like you know, wrappers or proxies or, or kind of plugins that, by the virtue of, of being able to assume this driver does DB API too, they, they can provide useful things. So. Uh, you might not really like it, but it's, it is a useful standard, so to speak. Uh, so we're going to do a quick overview of the existing drivers. And uh, there's quite a few drivers, right? <laughs> uh, I've ordered them from the least interesting to the most interesting, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm just going to say a few words about each one of them. And as you can see from the previous slide, we're going <coughs> to go and talk about PsychoPG in detail after. So, uh, right, that's, that's basically what, you sh what should be said about drivers, but let's kind of look at each one at least to, to, to kind of know what they provide. So drivers come in two varieties for Postgres. There are things that wrap libpq and they provide you know, a Python API above the C API that, that, that does libpq. And they tend to be fast because of that, because the, the actual protocol parsing database, blah, blah, uh, is done in C. They tend to do things right, because if libpq does something wrong, uh, you might argue it's, it's, you know, it's, it is kind of the reference implementation. So uh, they, they tend to get the, the protocol right. right? Uh, stuff like, you know, PG port or, or, or you can have your .pg pass. If you're using a libpq uh, wrapper, it will work, which is, which is great. Uh, and then, so yeah, basically uh, that's, that's the advantage of, of doing it w as a C wrapper. Uh, and then there's a variety that do just implement the protocol in, in pure Python. They just speak, you know, 
ship bytes over the network and kind of by implement the, 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 that spec. And so uh, the advantage would be to be able to run this kind of driver in an environment when you can't use AC extension. So uh, in, uh, for instance, with Python interpreters that are not CPython. So I don't know if you're familiar with PyPy or Jython. Jython is a implementation of the Python language in Java. And uh, it's not trivial to use a C extension in there, because I mean, the, the APIs are all different underneath. So yeah, uh, PyPy is an implementation of the Python language in Python, actually in a subset of Python. Mm, it, it's an awesome project. And uh, so if you want to use PyPy, you will have to go with something that's not a LPQ wrapper, or you will have to do some, some hacks that I won't go into. And so sometimes you can, we'll see how being a protocol implementation might help in some cases, but I, I think I prefer the PQ wrapper since PsychoPG is a PQ wrapper. Uh, so yeah, let's let's start with the, you know, the, the merry-go-round of Python drivers for Postgres. Uh, there's this project, PyPG SQL. It's a PQ wrapper. It has a module that's compatible with DB API, so they say uh, it's kind of inactive. So uh, just for historical interest, don't use that. There's PyGraphQL. That's a PQ wrapper that has its own interface, which is kind of like straight translation of libpq calls to Python. And then it has dbapi as a separate module that, that you can use if you need DBI, dbapi compatibility. Uh, the project seems to be alive still, not very active, but it, it looks like it, it breathes. Uh, but it's, I, I wouldn't use that given other options. There's BPG SQL. That's a pure Python implementation. So you know, if you like fancy implementing network protocols, you might look how they did this. Uh, it's kind of inactive. Don't use that. There is a ODBC wrapper. If for some reason you are compelled to use ODBC, you love ODBC, then you might try that. But I don't really see the point. But yeah, that's is there. Uh, there is PG Async, which I include here because because. Uh, uh, I like Twisted, and uh, Twisted is an asynchronous framework for Python. Uh, it's kind of the like the Node.js for Python, but it has kind of like 10 years of history. It's really you know, robust and, and featureful. Uh, and so even though the project is dead, I wouldn't recommend it. It's interesting because it, it gives you access to the asynchronous features of the, uh, of, of the protocol, which is uh, which is nice. Not, not all drivers kind of do that, and I think it's it's important because uh, because of the you know, traction, asynchronous computation is, is is getting. So, and it's a pure Python implementation, so that they can do things like you know, you you only write the message to the socket if it's writable, and then you wait for something to come on the socket. That's where being a Python implementation of the protocol is useful. Uh, there is PJ thousand. And uh, the name actually comes from it. So they, they say they are the 8,000th Python driver for Postgres. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just do one more. Uh, but this one's actually active, apparently. Uh, it has a DB API uh, interface, and it does extensions, which is good, because like, DB API obviously will not contemplate you know, large objects, because uh, you know, it has to work with, with SQLite. It's, it's actually, think about how difficult it was to get a specification for a database API, uh, for a database, database access API that everyone subscribed to, right? I mean, Oracle people, SQL people, Postgres people, everyone just kind of managed to get to a really core part. So, so that's cool. They do this, and then they give you the rest of the power. Um, and it's pure Python, so if, if you want to run on PyPy, because PyPy is, is fast, it's a JIT compiled. So it's a Python implementation that, that does JIT. So if you do calculate intensive stuff, you might try to use PyPy, and it's, it's really getting some traction right now. You would use that, probably. Uh, then there's PyPostgreSQL. It's a very interesting project. Uh, it's very actively maintained. Uh, it is a pure <laughs> Python implementation of the protocol. Uh, with some C extensions for speed. 
Um, it does have a DB API module, but it's, it's kind of you know, stuck in there just because you have to provide it. But they, they just read it everything. They, they, it looks like they threw everything away and then read it everything, thinking about Postgres. So it's very well you know, integrated with the features that, that, that Postgres gives you. Uh, you know, you have uh, an, an interface for advisory locks. You have you know, all these thingies that you don't find in other databases or that are very different. They do provide them. And then there's a sticky point. It's Python 3 only. So you wouldn't use that. I, it's, it's a shame. I mean, I, it's, uh, I don't think that was a good idea but to, to do that in Python 3 only. But until Python 3 is really, you know, has all the packages available and, and uh, it's installed by default on your workstation and so on, uh, you, you wouldn't use this. But it, it's a very interesting project. And then there's PG, which is, as I said, a libpq wrapper, uh, which is DB API 2 and has lots of extensions that we'll try to go through quickly. Uh, it is very actively maintained. The community is great. Uh, the mailing list is very responsive. People, you know, bugs get fixed. <laughs> Uh, documentation is serious, that's really good. It does work with Python 2 and Python 3, so you're, you're covered here, they, they, they already ported it, uh, and you can use it with, with both versions of the language. Uh, it does pay attention to, to how threading in Python works, so uh, it's, they, they do document it in depth, they do care about performance in threading environments. I won't go into that if then Either if, if you want to go inside it and we'll have time, we can, I can kind of talk about how Python threading works, because it's something that people, you know, there's a bit of FUD saying, oh, Python threads won't work. So not really, but, but they, they care about that problem, which is a good sign. Uh, so OK, PsychoPG, we're going to go with PsychoPG. Let's, let's see a few examples and, and talk a bit more in depth about the features. So that's a simple DB API example. You, you, know, you connect to the database, you give it a DSN, like a libpq DSN. Uh, you can, so you can use SSL mode, you can use uh, uh, CA root path, you can use all that, all that stuff. You, you, you create a cursor, which is, it has nothing to do with, with, with Postgres cursors, as in declare, so on. That's, this is a DB API thing that you know, wraps people the wrong way usually, like Postgres people, because it's, it's, it's kind of confusing. But this is just something you use to, to run the query and to store the result. There's nothing more to it. And then you execute your, you know, your code. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you just use the, the, the fetch all function that, that iterates over them, and you have access to the rows. Each row is a list. That, that, that you can access by index. And there's actually an extension to make this accessible by name. So you wouldn't say row zero, which is attack. You'd say row attack. So you'd say, I want the, the attack column. But by, by default, you get a, a list of lists. So each row is list. Uh, and then you close the connection. So that's DB API 2. Uh, should you use SQLite? That, that would change. And that would be the only part that would change. That's, that stuff is mandated by, by DB API, mostly. Uh, so parameters. Uh, th that's something that bites people that use PsychoPG. That's not that obvious. If you don't read the documentation, just try to you know, run with it. Uh, the, if, you, if you have a query string, you, you use placeholders. Uh, so you say percent %s, and then get substituted, uh, safely quoted. With, uh, with, with uh, parameters. Um, you have two ways of passing parameters. Either use percent %s or use a named a notation, which I'll show in the next slide. Uh, and the, the, the parameters are always a sequence. So let me just show you what I mean here. Uh, if you have, you know, you do execute, select, blah, blah, where last name equals percent %s without any quotes, and here you pass a one element tuple of something with a, with a single quote in it. This will get quoted properly, so this will get you know double quoted, uh, and 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 the query will run. But you see, this if this needs to be a sequence, which is something that people are you know sometimes not aware of or just forget. Uh, and uh, and there you, you don't put any quotes in there; they, they get put in by the driver. Uh, 
So th th this is the name notation. You can also say, uh, you know, this is, this is a percent %s, but it is going to refer to my prefix parameter. So this saves you some typing if you repeat the same parameter twice. And then you can just say O'Hara once and, and not, you know, duplicate code, which increases uh, probability of having a typo and so on. Uh, and then for integers, for instance, you use percent %s as well. You always use percent %s, which some people uh, get confused by because for it, it's kind of like uh, C printf uh, escape uh, sequences. So people would use percent %d for integers and percent %s for strings and so on. <coughs> but with PsychoPG, uh, you always use percent %s, and it does the quoting looking at the type of the parameter. So this, so like this will get single quoted, and this will just uh, be passed as is. Uh, there's this little function I put here. It's called Mogrify that uh, does the, you know, the, the, does the interpolation but doesn't run it. So if you just want to get the SQL that's going to be run or just want to quote it and then you know, ship it somewhere else, log it, whatever, you would use Mogrify. Uh, so what makes PsychoPG so great apart from being a fast DB API implementation? Uh, you get all kinds of goodies like uh, if you pass it a list, it gets transformed into an array. So that's, that's good. It has like uh, built-in support for Postgres arrays. Uh, if you pass it a, a tuple, you will get it uh, with uh, with uh, you know, parentheses um, notation. So if you do in percent %s and pass it a tuple, it will do in and the and the the, the thing that you use in in clauses. Um, you can register your own code to cast from types to other types. So uh, lists are built in, but you can you can say that H stores get read as Python dictionaries, which is, which is kind of natural. And then you can, you can pass in dictionaries, and they will get serialized to HStore, which is cool. Uh, and the same thing happens for you know, UID. You get the Python UID type. In it, you get uh, a class that kind of wraps in it addresses. And you can write your own. Um, you can customize the process of creating, the, of, of running the query. Uh, you can, you know, there are little hooks that can get you inside, then that's useful. And we'll see an example of how this can be useful. Uh, and it does asynchronous uh, quite good. There's a quite rich implementation of, of, of asynchronous features. Uh, so you might have noticed I'm, I am an asynchronous <coughs> junkie. So that's why I, that's why I iterate on that so much. Uh, but, but yeah, that's something I, I really like about them. Uh, so. It ju this is just an example of how would you use the, the extension mechanism to get the hook into the execution process. So you would say, instead of using you know, the, the <coughs> standard cursor that I get when I do <coughs> connection.cursor and I get this thing that runs my queries, I want to use this cursor that if when I execute, I overload this method to log the mogrified uh, SQL statement, and then just run the, the chain up to the superclass. And then you just, you just say, give me the cursor, but use my login cursor as the class. And then you will get, uh, and then you will get the, the, the query logged. And, and you can do, you know, you can do auditing with that. You can do, you can try to do rewrites of the SQL. You can do lots of stuff. Um, and here's an example of how HStore works. Just run a function that says, hey, when you get something from LeapEQ that's OID this, and this is obviously your responsibility to get, it can get it automatically, but you should probably get it yourself. Because it doesn't really know what, what is HStore. I mean, you can have a type in the public schema that's called HStore, but it's something completely different. So you, you, you just say, this OID is HStore. And then you, know, you run a select where you pass dictionaries. And this is our logging cursor that's logging, that's logging the select statement, and it will be serialized to, to HStore. It will be transformed to an HStore. So that's very convenient and, uh, and, uh, and actually really, really useful if you're using extension types. There's, uh, this is, yeah, uh, that's an example of asynchronous mode. You do connect, you say, I want this connection to be asynchronous. This is a DBI 
DB API extension, obviously. They don't contemplate asynchronous stuff. Uh, and then you just say, now you'll wait until the connection gets open, because the, the connection build-up process is async as well. Then I will get my cursor. I'll, I'll, I'll listen on my schemaverse error channel. And then I will wait for this query to complete. So it, here it's, it's, waiting and it, it's waiting again. And then I'll just uh, infinitely wait for something to be available for me. And I will look at the, the notifies that are on the connection. <laughs> So that will, you know, you run this, and it will stay there. With not, it will not consume any CPU until a notification is, is arrives, and then you will get instantly notified about this. Uh, and so, the the wait select function is actually something that's already provided, but it's very simple. You just say, you just ask the connection, should I read, should I write, or do you have something for me? If you got something for me, then I'll give control back to the user. If I should read, I will select with, uh, with uh, putting the file descriptor of the connection in the readable set. And if I need to write, I will wait for the socket to become writable. So it's really, you know, it's really neatly wrapped and uh, kind of understandable and, uh, and pretty well done. Um, so, so there's a subject for CyclePG that's transaction <coughs> management. Uh, transactions start automatically. Uh, so when you run a query, it will do begin and then run your query. And then if you're not careful, you will get this, this transaction will just stay open, right? So if you, ah, you just want to select some stuff, and then you, the object you know, sticks around because it's, you know, the connection is a property of something, and then it won't get garbage collected, so it will stick around. You will get an open transaction that will block your vacuum, and, and that's going to be bad for you. So you need to think about that, and every time you... You run something, uh, you then or commit or roll back the, the transaction. Uh, or you just say auto commit true, and then it'll just you know, directly pass what you say, what you do to, to the database without inserting that begin on its own. Uh, so this, it used to be worse. If you had bad experiences with that, that stuff got fixed recently. So now it kind of chugs along chugs along nicely. So use a recent version of, of CyclePG because the like 2.4 was really a good release. 2.4.2 I think is the current one. They, they really fixed some stuff. So what's missing and what's, uh, what you should contribute to CyclePG? Uh, they, it, they don't do uh, params. So they don't do PQ exact params. The SQL is stringified on the client side and then sent to the database. So the, 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 param the parameters interpolation happens textually, and then the text is shipped to the database. Uh, so people, like, for years now, from time to time, someone appears and says, hey, let's, let's do PQ exec params. And then people say, what would the interface be? How would I document that? How would I explain this in the manual? It kind of rings a bell with some other community I know that, you know, stuff that everyone needs get marooned by uh, kind of documentation issues or stuff. So that might sound familiar to you. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still not there. And then uh, prepared statements are, are more difficult because you need to do them by hand. Uh, uh, I mean, PQ exec params is faster because you don't do string manipulation in Python. You just you know, ship the, the stuff to Postgres. Uh, copy will not work with asynchronous connections, but you probably wouldn't care about that so much. Uh, and I'd really like, so the thing is, you use parameters and they are great, but if, if, if this is at something dynamic that, that your application uh, kind of receives externally or reads from configuration files and so forth, this one you need to interpolate inside Python and, and do it yourself. You can't like here say percent %l or percent %something and have it quoted for you. So this is something you need to do manually. Uh, and sometimes people don't understand. These are parameters that get quoted with uh, you know, parameter coding code. And these are identifiers that you need to code yourself and care about them, care about them yourself. So it would be nice to have something a bit more user-friendly there. Right, so 
ORMs. Why, why would you need an ORM? Right? No one likes ORMs. Well, actually, I think there are advantages. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this discussion too deeply, but there are use cases where you actually would like to use an ORM. It, it will allow you to you know, have less experienced developers go faster. Uh, it will help you for small projects. So it's, it's a fact of life. So let's just talk about that. Sometimes you just don't get to pick. You, you get asked, which ORM should we use? Your, your, you know, your project lead won't ask you, should we use an ORM? So, uh, so the answer is simple, use SQL Alchemy. Uh, uh, but before we go to SQL Alchemy, uh, I need to say a few words about Django ORM because Django uh, is, the, this is something that you will have contact with sooner or later because everyone uses Django if they do Python on the web and almost everyone that does Django uses the built-in database relationship mapper that they provide. So it's actually, it might be useful, so don't dismiss it. I'm, I'm going to say a bunch of bad things about, about Django ORM, but don't dismiss it outright. Uh, it can be handy. It, it does provide some features. For a small project, if, like, you know, what you do is you have, a, you have you know, a shopping list and you just add stuff, or you have a small online shop. That's, that's fine. It's just going to work. Your developers will be happy. The documentation will be, you know, they will have the documentation alongside their framework documentation. That's fine. Uh, but uh, it, it does have a few issues. Uh, so it, it doesn't support multiple column primary keys, which I, for me, it, it was just the first thing that dismissed it from the project. Uh, it does not support, so it, it's kind of generic. It says, OK, this is an RM. You can use it with MySQL, with Postgres, with SQLite. So it, is, it won't give you good support for Postgres features. Which we, so it tries to be polyglot, and uh, that kind of limits what it can give you. Uh, there was a, so there, there's a bunch of shortcomings uh, that, that I won't go into, but there was a lot of people telling me last year, two years ago, so I have this big Django shop and I have this huge problem with, with transactions that get hanging and block my vacuum and you know, eat my shared memory and so on. So that was a problem that I think they worked out. So this should now be much better, but if in, if in doubt, just remember that CycloPG will open a transaction by default when you first access the database. And so in your Django request response cycle, just make sure to close that connection when the, when the request is done. Right? So, so then you'll be safe. I mean, I know Django shops that work great with, with, with CycloPG and, and, just, and, and, and Django, and they don't have any issues. And I know people that complain a lot. So how to cope if you need to use the Django ORM or if you made the decision to use it? Use a connection pooler, definitely, because every request response cycle will open a database connection and close it. So it's going to be slow. Uh, and you will, have, you, know, you will have to up the max connections to high numbers if you want. Uh, look for these online transactions. Be aware that this might be a problem. You know, be proactive. Don't wait until you're right. You're, you know, load explodes because of, because of open transactions. Use CycloPG because you can use other DB API drivers with the Django RM. Don't use anything else. Use CycloPG. Uh, and if you want to dismiss it, think about it. Because even though it's not that great, it's still very well integrated. And you will need to you know, do the legwork of integrating a different ORM should you, should you choose this. So, Think about it. Um, so let's go into SQL Alchemy, which is uh, which is not only an ORM. It's a it's a complete you no know, framework toolkit, whatever you call it, that gives you everything you would need to work with SQL <coughs> from Python. So there are two main parts. There is the classical ORM. When you get Python objects, you get your database relations and you they map together so you access things from your application and then they get read from the database and then there's something that's like SQL but made in Python so it's uh, kind of like writing SQL by hand only using Python constructs and we'll see an example of how this works it's actually 
quite good. Uh, you can do everything with SQL Alchemy. If there's something you cannot do, they will consider it a bug. So that's, that's great. It's not like they say, yeah, we do this, and if you need something else, and I'll write raw SQL or, or whatever. I mean, you're on your own. No, they, their philosophy is uh, it needs to be possible because we, we do everything SQL. So that's good. Uh, and and it's, it has a learning curve. There are new words you will have to learn, new concepts. It's, it's complex, but once you get the hang of it, it's, you know, it actually pays off. So, um, so yeah, like I said, uh, you, you define your models, you define uh, tables in Python, but it feels like just writing SQL statements to, to create a schema, and then you map them together. And you don't even have to map them together. Or you can map some objects to one database and some objects to another database, or some objects to you know this connection and some objects just keep them unmapped. So that's good. You get separation between your business objects and your and your database. It does support things that you wouldn't think an ORM would support, like uh, you know database specific types, say in uh, you know UUID, uh, inet, hstore, all that stuff. Operators, so you do you know, all that funny point operators or, or H-store access operators, you can do them with SQL Alchemy. Uh, you can define your models so they will work with cascading deletes, right? So you have a, an ORM object, you delete it, and then the, the object that, that had a collection of those will, so the other way around. So you have your user and, and, and the user has her, uh, say, books. Right? And then you delete that user, and it will know that all the books of that user are gone if you configure it like that. So it's smart enough to, to follow that, and you can define that. that that's awesome. That's something you don't see every day in an ORM. Uh, it supports schemas, like Postgres schemas, which that's, that's great. I mean, you, you wouldn't think of that, and, and so on and so forth. It's it really, you can do everything. And it tries to get the last. 20% right. So Django says it's like 80-20, right? We do the 80% of the stuff right, and the, you're on your own with the last 20. And they say, we're going to do it all right. The cost is increased complexity, but hey. So how would, how, how would this work? You'd, you'd create just an object, which is just a simple Python object. There's nothing database, or I'm nothing here. It's just you know, your application. Yep. You mentioned cascading updates. Yep. Uh, so let's say it, it's it's basically foreign keys with on update on update cascade. So you will you will it will know that if you get an object update its attribute and and say save it to the database, it will know that dependent objects will be changed. So it's, it kind of is smart enough to follow that. And the same with deletes. It's, it's, more, it's, it's more common to have this problem with deletes, that you say, OK, I deleted something, and then I access this other object, and it says, something's wrong. It, you, know, you deleted it from, from underneath me. You can't do this. With SQL Alchemy, you, you can. It knows that the database will take care of that. So with Django, Django would just first delete all the dependent objects with a delete statement, and then delete your parent. And here you can say, when I delete my parent, the database will take care of the children objects. Do not touch them. They will not be there, because I have a cascading delete foreign key. So, so OK, you have your application object. You have your table. So ignore the magic for now. Uh, and just, uh, it's not that, mm, so yeah, there's some other place. It's not so bad. The thing is, you say, I want a table that's called car that has these three columns. And this one's a Unicode column. Then I want to limit the length. It's going to be a primary key. This one's going to be a car make. And it's going to refer to, to the table with, when I store my makes. And it's going to be deferrable. So before, look, before knowing SQL Alchemy, I wouldn't dream of an ORM that will know what deferrable <laughs> foreign key is and that will do the right thing with it, so it was great. And then, you know, I'm on price, that's numeric. Uh, and, 
And so I have my table, I have my logic object, and then I just say map one to the other. But I don't have to say that. Or I can <coughs> map it to, to another table. I can do this dynamically. Uh, and so, right, you have this and this. And then if you don't want to, you know, have your object separately and then your tables separately, you can use the more classical approach that other ORMs, like active record, I think, and so on, use which is, you know, just say, this is my class that, has, that is reflected in the database. And then it looks kind of the same, but just in one slide, right? So, uh, so, that's, so that's kind of quicker if you don't really need this separation. But it's there. Yep. So part of the way I noticed that um, for Django apps is that for Django, it's just easy to just build a model and have it work across the board. Mm -hmm. Uh, like it'll generate the SQL, build everything for the fly. Generally, you don't have to do anything after you build the model because of the integration. Uh, so worrying that, that it lacks, which you, which you pointed out, which is totally true. Uh, the, this or, or the Django RAM? I, I guess my question is, could you still build an entire Django app and use it for building the tables and for everything that works really well and upgrading and everything like that Django itself? You Uh, you, you might try to define your models both in Django and then separately define them like this and hope that they, you know, the definitions mean the same. So when you access it through this interface, it will be the same as the ones created by Django. So you might try that. I would advise against that. Uh, I think I would just, you know, if I needed something more than Django RM, I would take the hit and do, do migrations by hand, uh, write the schema by hand. I would just there do that. Yeah, but then, but, but then, so I, I'll have a slide that says uh, where it doesn't really fit with Django that well. Uh, so you might have migration, you might, you know, write some code, hook into the Django, uh, schema generation process and do the SQL alchemy thing. That's, that's actually what we do. But it's extra legwork. You need to know your framework well. Uh, your developers might get confused if you do this. So it's not standard. You won't you know, find one million Stack Overflow answer to everything. You will need to know what's going on. Uh, so better not mix. Better just say, I just throw out the URM and, and put it in SQL alchemy. Mm. So okay, you, you, have, you have these two ways of defining stuff. And then what's great about SQL Alchemy, and that's the part when you get excited, is that it's, it's all SQL. You, you, you have it, you know, you, you can just reach out and touch it. You can take your, your car, which is a table object, right? I'm talking about this, this car here. And you use a lightly magic incantation to compile it to an SQL statement. It will give you, you know, I needed this to be text that's limited with, by length. This was supposed to be unlimited, so it's text. Uh, there's, you know, deferrable foreign key that works. So you can, you can see, touch the SQL. It's really thought as something that compiles down to SQL. Uh, so that was the ORM. And now for the expression language part. So uh, you can use the URM uh, like in a typical way of, you know, I have my car, I need to know its price, or I need to know, I have this make, and I need to know the cars of this make that I have. So I just take the make, the, the cars attribute, and it will load all the cars magically. You can do that. Or you can just, you know, hand type your SQL, but in Python. Uh, so you, you, you get to write SQL. If you think about it, if you know, just cover your, I mean, hold your nose and say, I'm writing SQL, I'm writing SQL, only it's Python, but it is SQL, so you're going to be fine. And actually, there are advantages to it being Python, because you can, you know, get the select statement, ship it off to a different uh, class, subsystem, whatever, and it will tack on where clauses, and then some other thing will, will tack on the limit clause. Or, or you know, wrap it in the subselect. You get composability, 
which is great. Uh, you will be able to you know, use the URM and then in places when it generates bad queries or you want to use, you want to do something tricky because only then you get your beloved index count, you will be able to do this. Uh, and like I said, if you can't generate a statement you would like to write by hand, this is a bug and it should get fixed. So how would this work? So this is SQL, right? You say update car set price equals price plus two, where make lower make is Chevy. So notice a few things. Uh, I was able to use a lower function. I would be able to use any function I have, any stored procedure I have. So and it'll it'll figure it out. I was able to use the the equals operator and it got uh, it got put in the work clause as the equals and, and that's going to be substituted for the parameter and I was I was able to say set the price to the price plus two and it it knew what I meant right and so should should this be a string and I would say append like an s to it this would become the the, the two kind of pipes that, that is string recognition in Postgre. So it's smart enough to take your Python and, and make it SQL-y. So, so th th this, this actually feels good. This doesn't feel like you know, this bad ORM is, is doing bad stuff in my database. This is, I'm writing my, my SQL, only I'm doing it with this, in the same language as the rest of the application. And I use variables and I can use parameters and so on. That's, that feels right. Uh, so, like I said, what you get from using SQL Alchemy over, you know, handwriting your SQL, which is something we all like to do, but sometimes we can't, is that you can, you know, it's you have your application in one language, which is a good thing. Your developers are happier. You can test uh, easier. You can make it, you know, composable or or more. Uh, customizable if you if you do delegation of concerns correctly. You can only generate SQL and then ship it off to your you know, executing layer or your uh, or your you know prepared transaction manager that does that that uh, that multi-step commit. Uh, you can you can do that. You can ship it off to an asynchronous uh, execution kind of thingy that, that they will just receive SQL and run it, but you still get the advantage of writing it in your application language. Uh, you can augment your code, your, your logic objects with, 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 with stuff that you would, it would cost you to do this all in SQL. Like you can write some code to make a column transparently encrypted when you store it. So if you say, I'm storing something I need reversibly encrypted, like a user's API key, uh, whatever, and then whenever I will save this, it will get wrapped in a in a PGP SIM encrypt with with a key that I set in the configuration, and then when I read it, it's just going to be a plain string. I'm going to get it de decrypted, but the database will only see the encrypted, will only store the encrypted version, and you can have your 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 objects. You know, you won't have to always write first name, concatenate last name. You will be able to just have a property that, that gives you that automatically. So you, an ORM might be actually useful. Um, yeah, let's, I, I'm going to just skip over the slide because we're kind of running late. So when, if you use SQL Alchemy, you will come across this session object that kind of sits between your connection and your code that you use to access the database uh, and that, that, that keeps track of which objects are dirtied and which need to be persisted to the database. Uh, it, it, this is a thing you will commit or roll back your session. Uh, and then the good thing and the, the difference with, with Django is that it makes it easy to have persistent session objects. So you won't have to use a pooler if you can just store the session object in some persistent context. Like if you're doing web programming, you would use WSGI and then you would have something that that executes Python code and, and gives the, the, the generated response to the web server. And you would keep the session object inside the WSGI process that's persistent. 
and then you wouldn't have to use pooling because you wouldn't use uh, you wouldn't you know create and destroy connections on each response request response cycle. Uh, so so let's talk. So yeah, the, the last part is PL Python, which is kind of different. PL Python is uh, being able to run Python code inside Postgres and on, on behalf of the of the Postgres process. So it, it's kind of different, but it's, it's a way you can, if your application, if your stack is Python, you might want to uh, use, if you need stored procedures, you might want to consider using Python for that. So then your, your developers are happier because they only deal with one language and they don't need to you know, learn PL, uh, PG SQL and so on. So, uh, so this is Python inside the backend. Uh, it executes arbitrary code, so it's like it can run anything. It can open files, it can open sockets, it can delete your data directory. So it's untrusted. You, you need to you know, assume that if you're in an environment when you can't use untrusted languages, you're out of luck. Uh, I'm, if, if I have the time, I might say a few words about when or if this could change. But the, the simple, the short answer is it's very difficult to change that, so it will be untrusted for a long time. Uh, and it's, it's Python, so you actually can do crazy stuff. But that's kind of the fun of using Python inside your database. Um, so how does this work? Uh, when you run PL Python code, an interpreter, like, the, the whole Python runtime gets created, instantiated, and embedded in your, in your backend process. So if you want this to be fast, you should preload PLPython as well. So you won't pay the overhead on the first query of you know, DL open, looking up the shell library, and so on. Uh, and you want to use long-lived connections, so, this, so, so you won't even have to preload that. So it will just be kept in memory. Uh, it's well, quite well integrated with the Postgres type system. So if a PL Python function uh, receives a Pyth, uh, Postgres integer, you will see it as an integer inside Python. And if it receives a, let's say, array, you will see it as a list. So these, these things kind of work. Uh, the rest of the types will get serialized to strings. So if you have your, your, your own crazy extension type, what Postgres will do is it will call its text output function, get the string, and give it to Python. So then you would have to parse it back into some object that, that would be useful to you. There is an extension for the very typical case of passing hstores into Python and operating on it as dictionaries. Uh, so you might want to do that, but in general, you will need to deal with strings if you have you know, composite types and so on. Uh, Function arguments to stored procedures are visible as global. We'll see an example. Uh, so you just get to access them as if they were arguments to, the, to, the, to a Python function. Uh, and then you have a bit of magic that you can access that will allow you to run queries on the database that, in a trigger context, will, you will be able to access the tuple that's, that the trigger is called upon. So we will be able to you know, act upon that tuple. We'll see examples in a minute. And uh, so the, the, which modules are visible depends on the, on the Python path. This is a, a environment variable that's kind of like class path for Java or inc for Perl. Uh, so what's available, what's visible, depends on that. And the backend process got the backend processes get forked from, from the Postmaster. So if you need your application code to be visible to your PL Python functions, you probably will need to edit the environment that the Postgres executes in to include inside Python path your application deployment directory or, or whatever. There's just something to keep in mind that that's the way uh, to do this, probably. Uh, so like a, a, this is, I think this is just one slide about how to make PL Python not that bad if you don't want to play with it, if you want to actually run production stuff with it. Uh, keep all your code inside the module, inside your application. Don't just ship it in the database. Keep it under version control inside your application. Uh, make all the SQL functions just two lines. You, you create a function, you get some arguments, and then the only thing 
that actually happens inside SQL, the only thing that gets stored as a SQL function inside Postgres is you get the function and you call it and you pass it, you know, everything that's, that's inside the scope of this function. So this would include the arguments, this would include the, the trigger uh, information if it's there, that would include, you know, the module that you use to, that provides utilities and so on. And then the rest happens inside your application. And that has the advantage of being very testable because you get this function, you, you just pass it, you know, mocks for that, and you test it just with the rest of the replication. So it's kind of, that's, that, that should help. And, uh, and always be careful because you are, you are running full blown, a full-blown application language inside your database. You can hurt yourself bad. Uh, that said, there's a few funny things uh, you can do. Uh, so there are some examples, you know, give you a taste and then maybe some ideas, good or bad. Uh, what can you do? You can, for instance, import the numerical library and do fast Fourier transformations inside your database directly using, using Python code that then calls into optimized C that does stuff fast. You can write a check constraint that, that checks whether a column that's declared text holds JSON. Might not be the best idea, but, but you, you might do that. Or you might check that a byte Bytea is a, a PNG image or, you know, whatever. You can open connections. You can, you know, import CyclePG, connect to another database and have, like, DBI link with that. Uh, you can, uh, you know, do HTTP requests. You can invalidate caches on your... I know, I think Magnus uh, last year was talking about using PLPython to invalidate a varnish cache when something got updated in the database using an HTTP request. That's actually... That's a pretty good idea, I guess. Uh, and you can do, you know, things like network access and so on. So here's an example. That, that's a function that will get an extension name, and then it will get the standard diff lib. That's a library for doing diffs. Uh, it will get all the available except the extensions. So it uses the plpy module. Uh, that's, that's something you get that's available globally in every PLPython function that includes uh, an SPI interface. So you can run queries just like in, in PGPL SQL, you would, uh, you would be able to run, you know, select and execute it. That's how you do it in Python. And then you get all the names and you say, get me the closest matches for what I wrote, for, for what I've written. So this is X name right here. And these are the, the, the possible names that I have. So that would work. Planets, wait. <laughs> so uh, let's say I, I run find extension. It will return an array, so I will unnest it. And it's a Postgres array, right? I can call unnest. And I'm looking for this fuzzy stringy thingy that, that's there. And it, it will find you know, fuzzy string match. And if I look for hstore, it will find hstore. So, you know, we can run arbitrary code and, and use all the power of Python modules, all the, all the ecosystem, everything. Uh, there's a, yeah, there, there are two more examples. So this one is a check that might be a borderline good idea. I, I don't think I would recommend this, but it kind of, it kind of shows what, what you can do. So we get a trigger that gets the email of the new tuple, uh, splits it on the, on the at sign, so gets the domain name, and then checks if it has an MX record. And if it doesn't, it, it throws an error and says, whoa, it does, you don't have an MX record, right? So, so this would actually, if I have internet connection, oops, users. So yeah, okay, my email got inserted, but example org doesn't have an MX domain, so it says no MX record for domain example org. That's, that's uh, kind of cool. Uh, and then the last example I have here is, uh, you, is a function that will show you the, the pgcon schedule in the database, which works by Getting, downloading the, the iCalendar that's available on the website, you know, parsing it with the iCalendar module, then looking for events and just returning the summary, the location, 
and the time. And you will see I have three out parameters. Two are text, one is a timestamp. And actually, it will be timestamp. I will be able to do you know, calculations, time zone stuff, and, and so on and so forth. So um, let's, let's just look at the schedule. And uh, here it is. Yeah, I just downloaded the, the i calendar, and I parsed it. And, and here I have my date times and so on. So we're done. Uh, we are slightly over time. I don't know if there's something up next. Uh, if you want, if you want to ask questions, you can just ask, or if you, you can just you know come talk to me after. Uh, thanks for listening.